Yes, you guys, what's good? Today, I've got a double upload plan for you guys. With the first video that's been released, I'm gonna be speaking about a really revealing article written by The Telegraph, Sam Wallace. Um, I'm gonna be linking this article in the description, so I do suggest that you guys give it a read. Uh, you know, form your own opinions and make your own impressions. The article details a behind the scenes look at Lampard's time at the club, and you know, straight off the bat, this video is not gonna be a, a defense of Lampard video, because that's not the correct context. Instead, I'm gonna be speaking about the article's main focus, which was on the boards, its strategy, and potentially what this means for Thomas Tuchel as well. So I hope you guys do enjoy. Now to start things off, I'm gonna discuss the main focal points from Sam Wallace's article. The article did reveal that Marina did not see Frank Lampard as her number one candidate, and in a sense, he was basically a manager signed in the circumstances of the time. It states that Marina expected the same excellency regardless of the context of the situation, and of course, this was around the time when we had the transfer ban, and one of the main reasons as behind why Lampard was hired. It did reveal that Lampard had not even actually spoken to Roman over the past 18 months, which was, you know, pretty revealing. And it states that one of the reasons behind why Lampard was sacked was that Marina found his average points per game records, compared to all the other managers that we have hired in our recent history, was of an unsatisfactory nature. So due to that, he was out the door. It also mentioned other things that have been revealed and spoken about over the past few weeks in regards to Lampard wanting certain players out and your Alonso's, your Rudigas, your Jorginho's because he felt like these players weren't of the right stature in regards to the football he was trying to bring to the club. It did reiterate previous reports suggesting that Lampard did not want Lonzo, Rudiger, Jorginho and others because he felt like these players did not complement the ideas he was trying to bring forwards for this season. And it reveals that Marina did refuse the sale of these particular players. Now, the article revealed something quite interesting. It's in regards to our data analysts, club analysts in Scott McAcallan, and Matt Hallam. It reports that the setup continues to remain the same in a sense, in the sense that Marina relies upon the club's analysts to get realistic prices for transfer targets using comparisons and, and of course using the data which has become quite influential. However, the data analysts may help the process, but ultimately, Marina will have the final say on decision making. The article revealed that it was the data analysts that revealed that the reason behind why Declan Rice was not a target was not popular at the club was due to the data suggesting that the same issues which meant the club sold him in the first place still remain in rise to this day. And as it closed off, we got more revealing information in regards to maybe Lampard and Petr Cech having a bit of a strained relationship near the end, which was a massive surprise. Um, You know, I can kind of understand that in the sense that Petr Cech, of course, he's not going to leave when Lampard goes. He has a role set from at the club and to continue that, you have to work within the club structures, which makes complete sense. Anyone would do that. And of course, final clarity in regards to how much influence Lampard had on signings are uh, you know for a while I've known that Werner, Ziyech and Ben Chilwell were Lampard signings one of the reasons why Lampard and Petr Cech went party to these players to persuade them to sign for us however club signings like Kai Havertz was a, a long-term club signing and of course in football it's about finding that balance between manager targets and club targets too and it wasn't like Lampard was complaining about having Kai Havertz in the team now, these were some of the interesting points highlighted in the article. As I stress, it's in the description. Give it a read. But now for the next segment, I want to speak about Thomas Tuchel before I give some conclusions on the report based on my opinions. And, you know, with Thomas Tuchel, news has come out suggesting that if he wants to remain with his job, he must secure us consistent UCL spots every season, which makes a ton of sense because UCL money right now is imperative, it's important. The money you earn from participating in the tournament is so ridiculous that not being part of it can have huge financial ramifications for a club, especially a club like us that has you know, many players that are still on the books that were still, you know, contributing to their wages that we haven't been able to sell off, including the very high wage bill that we currently have too. So yes, from a business point of view, UCL football is important. However, is that pressure fair on Tuchel in a sense? As Tuchel himself did state, at first it was a concern. I was a little like, oh, why 18 months? And after one minute, I thought, what does it really change? What does it change? If they give me four and a half years, they could sack me anyway. If they are not happy with me, they will sack me anyway. And if they gave me four and a half years, they would put in a clause that when they sack me, they'll pay me. So where can I be sure that I'll be there for four and a half years? You cannot. That is the truth at this level. I decided not to worry too much about that, to be brave enough to take on this adventure because it was absolutely clear that I want to do it and I don't want to miss the chance. Of course, you know, big mentality from Thomas Tuchel and 
very valid concerns behind why he was offered such a small contract length. Uh, it's quite clear that the club, of course, are being financially prudent in the sense of the hire and fire nature and suggesting that to maintain his job consistently, UCL football must be guaranteed at all costs. It puts that pressure on where it's like, if Tuchel was to not get us a top four spot this season for the things that were potentially bigger than him, if, if that happens, of course, is that really fair to judge the nature and quality of the manager? Should that type of pressure be put on a long-term forward-thinking manager that's proven over the years that, you know, his way of football and his style does lead to success? Could this be a potential bottleneck? Now, I'm going to give my thoughts and opinions on my conclusions from the article. And, you know, for a while now, I have commented on the potential fact that maybe the board we have could be the bottleneck behind why we're not getting this consistent success year in year out. I understand that with our boards they come from the finance sector, the business sector, from, from law and I guess the best practices in which they worked in those previous industries, does that necessarily translate from those environments to a sporting environment? I'm not too sure. You know success is deeper than making big money signings and relying exclusively on data to help form your opinions. And for me, I'm constantly going to make comparisons with Liverpool and Man City uh, for a very valid reason in the sense that at the club in fact are looking at these two clubs as their you know domestic rivals for very good reason because they are the two leading teams in the Premier League right now. Back when Sheikh Mansour took over at Man City it was reported that they had looked at the strategic model that we use at our club to assess the strategic inconsistencies with us, which ultimately led to them applying their own structure, which was focused on a structural rebuild at the entire club compared to just spending big on big name players to hopefully get success. Since they took over in 2008, they've had only four managers in Mark Hughes, Roberto Mancini, Manuel Pellegrini, and Pep Guardiola. Since Roma took over, we've hired and fired 14 managers, 13 if you consider us sacking Mourinho to then hire him back again, to then sack him again. And can we say that this model, this strategy, has ultimately been the best long-term approach to success? That's a question I'll ask you guys. Now comparing Liverpool and ever since they got taken over by the FSG group, they've also only had four managers in the space of 10 years. Roy Hodgson was already at the club before the owners took over, so his sacking made you know, more contextual sense. In comes Kenny Dalglish, a Liverpool legend whose popularity was definitely you know, a great PR move in the sense, and you know, not even to be cynical, he won a trophy there during his time too. But in a sense, it brought back that positive light to Liverpool. And then comes Brendan Rodgers, a manager that has a long-term philosophy and principle, which Liverpool definitely benefited from. And once he eventually left, in comes Jurgen Klopp. And not only can he continue from certain aspects under Rodgers, but he can also improve that take that to the next level and I guess you can say the confidence that the Liverpool owners had in Jurgen Klopp was reflected in 2006 when Jurgen Klopp signed a six-year deal. This contract got further extended. Last year Klopp signed another deal extending that to 2024. If Klopp remains until his contract does expire, that would be Klopp remaining at Liverpool for nine years. Now Liverpool's owners in the FSG group have had experience managing other sporting clubs, most famously for the Boston Red Sox where when they took over in 2002, in the space of two years, they broke an 86-year-old hex, winning the championship two years after taking over the club. And since their ownership, the Boston Red Sox have become one of the leading baseball teams in the century. So in a sense, they already built a sporting principle and strategy that had worked in a different sport. They've come to Liverpool, they've applied those same principles, and now Liverpool are a leading club in the world. This was demonstrated when they got to two UCL finals, winning the UCL in the type of manner in which Roman, I guess, has always wanted. You know, complete football, dominated every team. And due to that long-term approach, that patience and the strategy, Liverpool are now a club where they can challenge for domestic honours, European honours every single year with a massive chance of winning them. This patience in their model was reflected massively in their transfer strategies. For example, when Klopp had no left-back, pre-Andy Robertson days where James Milner was used more as a left back over Moreno, who just wasn't up to the standards that club needed. You know, instead of going to the market and desperately signing any left back for an overinflated fee, Klopp and the club decided it was best to wait for the right targets to become available. In comes Andy Robertson two years later, and since then, he's become a leading Premier League left back, and they haven't looked back. Now, the question that I want to pose is that if we applied our club strategy to your Liverpools and your Man Cities, 
Would Liverpool and Man City have had the same success since? That's the question I want to pose to you guys. Since the start of the new decades, from the you know 2010-11 season all the way to the 19-20 season, we've seen examples of a lack of clear direction over the decades. We've seen three different transfer strategies. The first one was after we won the UCL. In came some of the most exciting young players in the world in Oscar. Eden Hazard, a massive group, you know, beating a signing to, to much stronger teams at the time. In came the Belgian boys, Lukaku, De Bruyne, Courtois, Hazard, you know, four world-class players that are leading in their positions right now. And unfortunately, that strategy was never able to reach its potential because in the space of no time, things were scrapped. World-class potential talent were never given the opportunity. They moved on, found success elsewhere. Since the fallout from that failed strategy, in came a second one which focused on looking at players that had their market value depreciated, but still had, you know, high reputation, high potential, but the club felt like they could sign them for, you know, less than their market value, thinking that their value would boost up because the club could unlock their potential. Players like your Emerson's and Ross Barkley's are prime examples of this. Older experienced players were looked at as well, and altogether that was another failed transfer strategy, you know, most notably dominated by the failure of the signing in regards to Danny Drinkwater, signed for nearly 40 million, earning six figures a week to this day. Still remaining at the club, the club is still paying for his contracts, paying for most of it, even though he has been loaned out to Turkey. And after that failure, in comes another transfer strategy, which of course goes back to the previous one in which we signed the Belgian boys. You know, we're now going after top European talent that has world class potential. Of course, it's very exciting, and hopefully, this is an indication in regards to the club learning from some prior mistakes. However, the reality is, is that yes, you're signing these guys for big money, but due to their age, it's not like it guarantees that quality immediately. These are players you sign because you think in the next three years, they're gonna be that world-class elite. However, the potential bottleneck with this new strategy could be in the fact that if there's no long-term manager for these guys to be able to build that tactical consistency, tactical ideas and philosophy, is that ultimately gonna get the best out of their talents? I guess only time will tell. If I'm being extremely, extremely cynical, I can compare the spending in regards to when Roman took over the club. The success and trophies that came from that compared to the previous decade from you know the 10-11 season all the way to the end of the 1920 season where we spent even more money now yes i know that you know market rates have been inflated so that's going to skew the money we've spent however we've still spent over a billion in these past 10 years but did we get the same success uh compared to when raman first took over and the money we spent we spent wisely we were able to build an identity and a core, which even though managers were hired and fired, the players could still maintain that style of play, which led to unbelievable success. And comparing that decade to the last decade, we've won one less league title. We've competed less for the Premier League compared to that decade. We've not won a single Community Shields compared to the two won previously in that past decade. We've won one less League Cup compared to the two before. We've only won two FA Cups compared to the three before. And yes, our European success has been there this decade. However, you could say that when we won the Champions League, that was entirely due to that core set of players that we signed originally when Roman first came over, who were able to get their final hurrah before their careers ended. And the two Europa Leagues came at the cost of not qualifying to the next rounds of the UCL. Even in the UCL competition, we used to be a team consistently getting into the semi-finals. That's only happened twice these past 10 years. We've spent 1.1 billion during that 10 year period. So if you include the summer spending, that takes up to 1.4 billion. Yet this approach has not translated to trophies in the cabinet. To end with my conclusion, I'm really looking closely at Thomas Tuchel. We've signed another philosophy manager. The third one recently, you know, with Sari, Lampard, and now Tuchel being in control. We've seen with Tuchel's success that when he has the time to build, when the structures at play support his ideas, the success is there. An exciting possession style football that definitely can work with the players we have in the squad right now. However, the context is if Tuchel does not secure us a Champions League spot come the end of the season, he'll be out the door. And I guess in that sense, if that hypothetical situation happens, would that really be fair? Considering the context that he's come in halfway through a season where, where he's had no pre-season, where he's barely had any time to impart his tactical philosophy and his systems. What if, like Frank, 
terrible injuries were to come in the future, or injuries to key players which could dramatically affect the ability to get a UCL spot. Would that be a fair and a valid reason to sack Tuchel when the conditions that he came into aren't even perfect at this point in time to really demonstrate his full capabilities? I guess reading between the lines you could maybe come to some conclusions in regards to why Tuchel may be focusing on using certain tactics because of course if he wants to continue maintain his work, improve it and elevate us in the future he must get us a UCL sport at every cost. And just like Frank Lampard signing, the board maybe preferred Nagelsmann over Tuchel. You know, after so many years of hiring and firing and seeing so many inconsistencies, for me, it paints a picture that the board does bottleneck their long-term progress at this club. Tuchel is probably the best example of a manager that the club needs to be able to push forward and grow even more. If he was not to get supported eventually, maybe this hypothetical scenario could then paint more pressure on the boards and their strategy at this club. But you guys, on that note, I'm going to wrap things up and keep things moving. There is going to be another video out later today, but I'm going to discuss some transfer targets that Tuchel is looking towards, that the club are looking towards too. So stay tuned for that, you guys. Comment your opinions below. On that note, I'm Nini FC. This is Blue Lions TV. I'll catch you guys later with some more videos.